Okay, welcome to the first podcast for Shakespeare and Lent. Today I'm going to focus on Romeo and Juliet, but specifically just the prologue to begin with. I'll probably come up with a couple of other podcasts, perhaps to talk about the first couple of lines in Act 1, Scene 1, and then maybe the final or, or penultimate image at the end of the play. But for now, I just want to focus on the prologue and just get us a sense of of, of what's going on in this play, because the prologue, it's very rare for the, the tragedies to have a prologue, and the fact that it's there gives us a sense of, of how to comport ourselves, how to, how to dispose ourselves to the text, which most of us already know the story. Romeo, Juliet, tragic lovers, too young, too young to handle love. And that seems to be the, the sort of imputation put upon on this play and upon those characters. They're too young for all of it. And uh, as such, they're impetuous, they're rash, and they make major mistakes. If they just had a little bit of wisdom and could hold back and wait, then all of this, maybe, maybe none of this would have happened. I understand that critique of Romeo and Juliet, but the prologue seems to be suggesting that despite any critique that we have on those characters, something else is affected by this tragedy and by this sacrifice. Let's look at the prologue. Get out your, your Romeo and Juliet and just turn to the first page. It's right after the dramatis personae, or the list of characters, and right before Act 1, Scene 1. And uh, we're given a sense of the scene, so we're entering into Verona, which is Italian, very Catholic, <clears throat> kind of a, a taboo place for England, if you think of London, which has separated itself now uh, for a for hundred years uh, away from, from Rome. But nevertheless, we're there in, in Italy. Let me just read it, and you follow along with me while I read it. Well, what's interesting about the prologue is it, it's a sonnet. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a perfect sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet, following the, the rhyme scheme of the Elizabethan style. And as, as is the case with every sonnet, there's a volta, or a turn. There's, there's a point where the sonnet presents one thing and then turns and accepts sort of an ironic response or solution to a problem. So let's, let's go in, let's read it. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which, but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The witch, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. So I love this sonnet, especially teaching to students, because you can you can go to those last two lines and say, look, this should only take you two hours to read, <laughs> which is kind of, I mean, it, it would take them maybe a little bit longer, but that's, uh, if it's acted out, it would take about two hours. And so you get a good sense of it. But also, I, I would say what's what's magnificent about this prologue is the setting of it. It's not just a place, it's not just Verona. It's, it's the world of violence. It's the world of vengeance. So Verona is stuck in what we refer to as the cycle of violence. The Montagues are injured by the Capulets, and so redouble an injury upon the Capulets, who then feel injured and then strike back at the Montagues. And that just, it's a never-ending cycle which is referred to here as the, their parents' strife. So you get a sense here, at the beginning, we tend to think of Romeo and Juliet, because we know it so well, we tend to think of it as a story of young lovers, but the setting of it is the parents, the problem with the parents. Romeo and Juliet inherit the conflicts of their parents and have to fight the wars of their parents. But what we, I would say the turn here, what we would call the volta, is the line, doth with their death bury their parents' strife. So the death of Romeo and Juliet 
ends the conflict, ends the cycle of violence. And so that, we would have to imagine, is an effect outside of the intention of Romeo and Juliet. Once we come to know Romeo and Juliet, we have to believe they just fall in love with each other. They don't fall in love with each other because they imagine that they'll cure the war, that they'll, they'll, solve, they'll fix the war, they'll end the war. They fall in love with each other because they fall in love with each other. An unintended consequence of that is, is that their sacrifice, because of that love, ends the cycle of violence, which is one of the most difficult things to, to end, to come to peace. Really, only Christ is given that ability. He's the Prince of Peace, the one who can bring peace, because he has authority over all things. So in this, what we get a sense of is, outside of their intended consequences, or outside of their intentions, the consequence of their love and the sacrifice of their love brings about something redemptive, brings good out of evil. So from the very beginning, in the prologue, despite the rashness, the impetuousness of Romeo and Juliet, they're too young, all the, all the critiques that we have against them, nevertheless, we're told from the very beginning that this effect, this, this love, has an effect outside of itself that redeems the time. Now, normally, the, the term we use to describe things that have an effect that redeems, so an effect that brings good out of evil, we call that efficacious, which we normally only refer to sacraments that way. And an effect, uh, an, a sacrament is efficacious, so we receive the body of Christ. We don't have to intend all the redemption that, that Christ is capable of. We can't even imagine the, the redemption that he's capable of. But the sacrament in the body of Christ is efficacious. It brings about an effect that redeems. Not because we intend it. We, we allow, for, we, we say yes to it, but we don't intend it. It's not really a part of our plan, it's a part of Christ's plan. So here, at least at the beginning, what we see Shakespeare is, is playing out is what is the efficacy of, of sacrifice? And, and here, we tend to think of, of this play as, you know, because it ends in suicide. I don't think it glorifies suicide at all. I think we sit back and say, and, and, and wish it never happened. And we see the tragedy of it. But, but nevertheless, what we get here is, is a sort of calling out for, for something sacramental and for an end to the cycle of violence. Any kind of, so imagine entering into the city there's all sorts of cycles of, of vice. We enter into different types of cycles in different times. And the cycle of violence is the one that civilization seeks to avoid most. People can have disagreements and they can confront each other. But once that enters into violence, that's something that the state has to step into and, and try to prevent. And so here, the only thing that could do that, the state can't do it in Verona. The only thing that can do that is... Romeo and Juliet, two enemies loving each other. So the beginning is a wonderful setup for us, gives us a good comportment, a good setup. So maybe this is, although there is something young, naive, and rash, there's something very important happening here in this play. So for the next podcast, I'm going to jump into maybe the first couple of lines of, of Act 1, Scene 1, and just give you a sense of what else is going on with Verona. For now, just take a look at the prologue again. Read it over and over again, maybe a couple of times, in preparation for the rest of the play, so you get a good sense of what Shakespeare wants to prepare you for. All right, thank you for tuning in, and the next podcast is on its way.